Letters from the Lighthouse, Chapter 24 V for Victory It had never been the refugees' plan to stay long in Budmouth Point. Although in the end they got a warm welcome here, our country's immigration laws were not so friendly. Without official visas, the Jews were termed enemy aliens, which to me sounded like more nasty name-calling. Technically, it meant they weren't supposed to be here. Over the following days, a few more of the refugees left. Mr Geffen headed to Canada, Miriam and Reuben, Elise and Jacob for America. Realistically, I knew it wouldn't be long before Esther and Dr Worth went on their way too. Meanwhile, knowing Suki was still on the other side of the channel made missing her even harder. German-occupied France was a dangerous place. No one had heard from her. No one could get hold of her, though Miss Carter, still blaming herself, tried every possible avenue. I think she even considered sending a pigeon. I felt hopeless because there was nothing I could do. It was unbearable to think we'd come this far and Suki might not make it home safely. Yet, much as I adored my sister, I was beginning to understand Mum's view too. Suki was brilliant, but she wasn't necessarily careful. The fact she travelled all the way to France, then missed the boat home, was a rather good example of it. Yet, as much as Suki was careless, she was brave and resourceful, so we shouldn't have been surprised that she eventually found her way back to us in the manner she did. One morning, as was often the case, I woke very early. It was soon after Cliff had come out of hospital. Not strong enough to face the lighthouse ladder yet, he was staying at Mrs Henderson's with Mum, and I'd not quite got used to having the bedroom to myself. I'd read all my books from home countless times, and the ones on the shelves above our bed as well. Knowing I'd not be able to get back to sleep, I decided to go for a walk. Come in, girl, I whispered to Pixie, who was stretched out on Cliff's bed. She opened one disinterested eye, which I took to mean... No. Pulling on a cardigan over my nightgown, I grabbed my coat and shoes and tiptoed down the stairs. Outside it was just getting light. There was no one about, only gulls circling the harbour, which was always a sign the fishing boats were due back soon. For once, there wasn't even a breeze. The sea was flat, silky looking, the same pinks and blues and oranges as the sky. Dropping onto the beach, I started walking. I'd not been down here since the refugees arrived and the crunch of shingle underfoot brought back to me vividly the drama and panic of that night. Only twelve refugees were left in Budmouth. It was mid-March now, which meant that they'd been here for almost a month. They'd settled well. In a way, it felt like they'd always lived here. And on a day like today, when the sea was kind and the sky bright, it was easy to forget anything bad or dangerous had happened, was still happening, across the Channel in Europe. At this time of day, the tide was a long way out, making the beach seem wider and flatter than usual. Before long, I'd reached the groin where I stopped to gaze out to sea. I heard the engine first, a chugging, spluttering, that for a split second made my heart stop. But boat engines I was learning sounded different from aeroplanes. The boat rounding the headland was the first of the fishing fleet returning to harbour. You could tell the catch was good from the way the hull sat low in the water. It passed close enough to shore for me to see the men on board laughing and joking with each other. One of them waved to me, a proper gleeful two-armed wave above his head. He made me smile as I waved back. By the time I reached the harbour again, the fishing boat was already moored up. The men had unloaded their nets and were stacking boxes of silvery fish on the quay. It was an impressive, delicious sight. and got me thinking about mackerel on toast for breakfast. So I wasn't paying a huge amount of attention when someone called out, Olive, is that you? I froze to the spot. I'd have known that voice anywhere. I can't believe it, she cried. It stunned me. I couldn't believe it either. But there was no mistaking who it was. 
I didn't even get a proper look at her. She threw herself at me with such force we both fell backwards across the cobbles. The person holding on to me was soaking wet and terribly in need of a bath. I didn't care. I clung to her as tight as she clung to me. I saw you on the beach, Suki mumbled against my neck. I was on the fishing boat waving. She was sobbing and laughing all at once. So was I. When at last we pulled apart, I looked at her properly and thought for one awful moment there'd been a mistake. This wasn't my sister at all, but a stranger. Last time I'd seen her, she'd had curled hair, face powder, lipstick, the works. Now she was wearing trousers and a man's tweed jacket with a woolly hat pulled down over her hair. I'm not looking my best, am I? Suki joked feebly. It didn't matter. None of that silly stuff mattered. I'm just so glad to see you, I whispered. Me too, she said, cupping my face in her freezing cold hands. What? I mean, how? I managed to say. There was so much I had to ask her, I didn't know where to start. The fishermen had stopped unloading their catch to watch us. It was funny how they gazed at Suki as if she was their favourite long-lost daughter. One of them called out, Caught more than fish today, didn't we, eh? I recognised him. He was the man who'd argued with Queenie about the lighthouse, who'd told Mr Barrowman to shut up over the German pilot. I'd had him down as a, an old curmudgeon, but not any more. He was the man who brought my sister safely home. I stared at Suki. Where did they find you? Suki laughed, her lovely, tinkly laugh. Oh, her drift in the channel in a rowing boat. They rescued me late last night. It was a stroke of absolute luck. I can't thank these dear chaps enough. It was just how things were with Suki. Even in the middle of the English Channel, she'd found people willing to help her. This time, though, she'd been the one trying to help others, and she'd risked her life doing it. It was easier, and warmer, to go straight back to Mrs Henderson's. She'd made tea and crumpets and banked up the sitting room fire so it quickly grew stifling. Suki, in borrowed dry clothes, her hair wrapped in a towel, sat as close as she could to the hearth to get warm. We didn't mean to wake everyone, but it wasn't long before Cliff came downstairs. His face was an absolute picture when he saw Suki. Throwing his arms around her, he stared at her, speechless. Can we go to the cinema again? was the first thing he managed to say. A proper trip that lasts more than ten minutes. The next footsteps on the stairs were Mum's. Seeing the chair pulled up to the hearth, she stopped in the doorway. Hello, Mum. Suki rather sheepishly stood up. Oh, Suki, Mum said quietly. You silly, silly girl. I braced myself for the hugs, the kisses, the happy tears. Cliff's favourite bits in films were when long-lost people got reunited. Yet this was real life concerning people we loved. Mum, though, wasn't smiling. You weren't well. The doctor told you to rest, didn't he? No work, no stress. That's what he said, Suki tried to explain. Oh, my darling girl, Mum murmured. I've been so desperately worried about you. Suki started crying. I was only trying to help. I knew you wouldn't want to let anyone down. When they hugged, it was like watching two people cling to each other for dear life. It was quite overwhelming, and so typical of Mum and Suki, whose love for each other was always the boldest, fiercest kind. Eventually they sat down on the settee. Suki, her feet tucked under her, leaned against Mum. I've got some explaining to do, Suki admitted, addressing me. I'm so sorry I left you and Cliff during the air raid. I shouldn't have shouted when you came after me. Knowing what I knew now, it made sense that she had. Me calling Suki at the top of my voice when she was pretending to be Mrs Arby would have blown her cover. I ended up with Mum's coat, I told her, and I found the note you'd hidden in it, so we managed, eventually, to work out what you were up to. I could sense her looking at me, really looking, like she was seeing something new. You clever old stick, 
she said finally, which made me stupidly pleased. Then she unwrapped the towel from her head and shook out her damp hair. Good grief, Mum gasped. Your beautiful hair. It's so short, Cliff cried. Actually, it wasn't much shorter than mine, but you could see lumps hacked out of it. A haircut done in a hurry. I had to, Suki explained. It was a disguise to get past the soldiers. Cliff looked aghast. I've never seen a boy with hair like that. Personally, I thought it looked daringly glamorous, especially on Suki. Mum ran her hand over it like she was stroking a cat. Why do you get yourself into these scrapes, she said, though not unkindly. You didn't even have the good sense to catch the right boat home again. I didn't miss the boat on purpose, Mum, Suki replied. I met someone, and our meeting took longer than expected. You see, the man, Monsieur Bonnet, knew Dad. Mum's hand fell into her lap. How? He was with him at the end. I covered my mouth, but Suki reached for my hand and clasped it tightly in hers. I hoped some of her courage would seep into me, because I wasn't sure I was ready for what she had to say next.